We've heard a lot today about interdisciplinary collaborations. It's not easy to build a bridge between two worlds, but our next speaker, Paula Drogi, has done it. Dr. Drogi is a philosopher by training. She got a PhD in philosophy from the University of Connecticut and a master's from Montclair University. But she is now pursuing collaborations with scientists in order to better understand the nature of consciousness. I'm very excited to see what she's come up with, and I'm sure you are too. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Drogi. Thanks, Lauren. And I want to thank the organizers for including a philosopher in this roster of eminent Penn State science and engineering professors. Uh, my work on consciousness theory has led me to be curious about how the sciences like evolutionary biology, the neurosciences, and systems engineering interconnect to tell us how the mind works. But I don't think science alone can answer the question, why be conscious? To answer this question, we need to have a clear idea about what it means to be conscious. Philosophers specialize in meanings, so I think we can be of some help. Or not. <laughs> One of the obstacles to progress in answering the question, why be conscious, is the problem of the philosophical zombie. Philosophical zombies don't look like this, or like the zombie ants that David showed us earlier. They appear just like everyone else, with just one difference. They're not conscious. So, a philosophical zombie might look like this. <laughs> or, like this. I'm standing up here, behaving just like you'd expect, talking about consciousness, just what you would think that a person who was conscious, like yourself, would be doing, being conscious. But, the problem with the philosophical zombie is that there's no possible test that could determine whether or not someone is conscious. It is possible to imagine that all the behavior and physical processes a person exhibits could go on just the same way, without any consciousness. I think this way of thinking about consciousness is fun, but not helpful. People get no end of joy imagining that when I see blue, maybe you see yellow. How could we know? It's essentially subjective. Imagining consciousness as separable from brains and behavior is fun. But the result is that science cannot help us answer the question, why be conscious? Instead, I recommend we think about consciousness as functional. We should assume that consciousness like every other aspect of biological life, serves a function, and then try to figure out what that function might be. One good proposal by Franz Brentano is to think of the function of the mind as to represent things. Brentano was a German philosopher at the end of the 19th century who suggested that the critical difference between physical processes, like digestion and heart rate, and mental processes, like thought and perception, is that mental processes involve representations. The word representation is tricky because it's used in a lot of different ways. Philosophers disagree a lot on what representations are. A neuroscientist might think of representations as uh, sets of neurons correlated to a particular process like vision. A computer scientist might think of representations as symbols operated over in a computation. One is a concrete physical system, like a brain, Another is an abstract relation that could be instantiated in a brain, a computer, a set of water pipes, or whatever. And this is where a philosopher can help. It's my job to try to pin down which way of thinking about representation is the most appropriate for answering the question at hand, why be conscious? I'll just give you a very brief answer to this question. It's a very contentious question. I won't convince any skeptics by what I'm going to say in the next five minutes. Uh, but our job here is to think about possibilities. So I'll give you one possibility for how this might go, and then I will uh, talk about how that answer might answer another question. How, you know, are fish conscious? So first, why be conscious? I think that the reason we need to be conscious is to integrate information about what is going on right now. The function of consciousness is to represent now. So what's going on now? I'm here, you're here, there's the auditorium, there are various bodily sensations that I'm having, thoughts that I'm having. All of this stuff I'm representing now. It's part of what I'm conscious of. I need to know what is happening now 
in order to keep track of how things are progressing toward my goal. Where I am in my talk, how much time I have left, I need to know what is happening now because I might need to change my plans if things go badly. Maybe I need to speed up my talk, maybe I need to slow down, or if some new information suggests a better plan, maybe the fire alarm goes off and I need to abandon the talk entirely and exit the building. I need to know what is happening, or I, excuse me, um, creatures like me need to be conscious when they are capable of changing their plans in this way, utilizing new information to see if things are going according to plan or if some change is needed. So if the function of consciousness is to represent what is happening now, how can we tell if fish are conscious? If creatures need to be conscious in order to change their plans on the basis of new information, the way to find out if fish are conscious is to see if they change their plans. See how easy philosophy can be. We look for evidence of behavioral flexibility in fish. And there is some good evidence that fish do have this flexibility. One example is a study by Logan Grossman and his colleagues with cichlid fish. Here we have an observer fish at the bottom right watching two cichlids fighting for dominance of a territory, which they tend to do when they're both put in the same territory. All the fish are the same type. I just used a different icon for the observer fish so we can keep track of him as he's watching the different fights. And the fighting fish are matched in terms of size, except that some are better fighters than others. So the observer fish watches A like B and C like B wins. Sorry. And then the observer watches B fight C and we need to switch the place in the tank so all the winners don't come from the same direction. And D wins. The observer watches D fight C and C wins. And the observer watches D fight E and D wins. So the critical question is, when B and D are put in the same tank, can the observer fish figure out which is the more dominant fighter? It looks as though it can only figure this out by remembering that B fought C and B was the winner, and that D fought C, the same C, and D was the loser. It needs to remember those fights, remember C as the common element between those fights, and then remember this B and this D in this current situation as the winner and loser, respectively. So it can only figure out which is the most dominant by having all of that information right now. So can it do it? You can expect the answer, yes. The observer fish, when put in the tank midway between B and D, will swim towards D, which is the least dominant fish, in hopes of winning. So if I'm right that the function of consciousness is to tell us about how the world is now, and the cichlid fish needs to know how the world is now in order to know which fish is the weaker of the two fish, then this test is evidence for consciousness in this species of fish. One of the interesting aspects of research on fish is that their cognitive abilities vary widely from one species to the next. Some fish are just a lot smarter than other fish due to evolutionary demands of different niche environments. So we can ask if one species of fish is conscious, are all fish conscious? And the answer is maybe not. Here on the left are the fighting cichlids, and on the right are simple anchovies. These fish spend all their time in schools, but it doesn't seem to have made them any smarter. Anchovies <laughs> avoid prey by amassing in large groups and collectively responding to pending threats. It looks as though this grouping behavior is produced by simple stimulus response cues between neighboring fish. Neither the individual fish nor the group as a whole shows much evidence of flexibility, and so on my view of consciousness. But we just don't know. The important point is that we might know. By changing how we think about what it is to be conscious, by asking what consciousness does, we gain some traction on the problem of consciousness that opens the way to scientific research. Thinking about the possibility of zombies is fun, but not helpful. Thinking about the function of consciousness as representing how the world is now, such as in this goby fish, 
may help us solve one of the most puzzling questions that we face today. Why be conscious? So I want to thank you for your time and for my source of all things fishy, Victoria Braithwaite. <laughs>